it was so bad, so you know, within three, four months, I had to hire an armed police officer to protect the employees leaving the parking lot because the vendors were starting to threaten employees because they had already lost money in a first bankruptcy. This business served black women. I think it's fair to say that the capital markets and the general country was not particularly gracious toward this company for 20 something years. Now, all of us probably know the term goodwill from an accounting context. And in this capitalistic world, in many ways, this value is decided by the buyer. Now, our next guest argues that in reality, goodwill, which should mean a whole lot more than an accounting concept, is earned and cannot be bought, but if done correctly, can be worth a whole lot. This, as he saw in his tenure as the unlikely CEO of Ashley Stewart, a popular plus-size clothing brand serving and employing predominantly black women where he reinvented the company from the brink of bankruptcy with what he argues was a recipe of kindness that shocked the world. So much so that Jamie Dimon called upon him and said, you're changing the vector of capital. Apart from being a TED Talk sensation, a man of paradoxes, James Reed today invests out of his own family office. He's also the chair of entrepreneurship and senior advisor of the Global Women's Center at Howard University, senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management, executive residence at the MIT Leadership Center, and I cannot wait for you to dig in. James Ree, I am so excited to be here with you. And of course, we just came from an amazing weekend uh, with the mayor, with our Asian American community. Talk to us a little bit as we begin here about your reflections on the weekend. I think it's pretty cool that you have a 40 something year old woman, mother, mayor in Boston, and I've been living here for a long time. I'm not sure if I ever thought I would see that happen in my lifetime and happen. And that she and a very youthful team pulled together, what was it, like 40, 50, 60 yeah. people nationally across the country, across disciplines, focused on money, arts, and civics. It was impressive. I had a really good time. That is a great segue for us. I mean, we're talking about arts, civics finance. And those are the intersections in which you represent throughout your life, James. You're a unicorn in many different ways, uh, a hot mess, as you like to call yourself. Talk to us a little bit about who James is and context frame a little bit for us. It's taken me a long time to really understand who I am, what I am. And I think we all go through that journey. So that's mm -hmm. one thing I like to say, right? And I'm doing this here right now with you because when I admire you and your life and your life's work, but I want other people who are younger than me to sort of get there faster than I did in terms of understanding what it's all about, what life's about, who you are, and sort of being willing to sort of see the truth, good, bad, and indifferent. So for your listeners, yeah, I'm like a 52-year-old guy who used to teach high school, went to law school to be a public defender have had a long career in private equity, investing. I've done growth, distress. As I told Brene, I'm a hot mess. I ran a company with a fair bit of success uh, that was employing and serving primarily black women. Mm -hmm. And I teach at MIT and at Howard, and I'm a media guy, an arts guy, and sort of a quant guy. And the way I blended all of it is, um, it's really what I like to say, it's about kindness and math. I, that's the only thing that I could come up with that made me less of a hot mess, that it made sense to me, that I'm a humanist and a fierce advocate for people. And I'll, I'll always be a high school teacher at heart. Um, I want people to just, I want them to be successful in their own terms. That's just how I've lived my life. So teacher, educator, mm -hmm. and then public defender, and then private equity guy. How did this thread of your life unfold? Was it, oh, this made sense at this point in time? Were your parents, of course, uh, a lot of our, yeah. uh, you know, high performers on this show are from the Asian upbringing where you were expected to be a certain way. Uh, the de definition of success is very limited. How yeah. did you navigate that? Mom definitely played a huge role because she always used to want me to do what I wanted to do. And I'll always be indebted to my mother for that. Dad pushed back a little bit more, wanted me to have more of a bit of a linear path. Mm. Always scratched his head and said, why are you making 12 grand a year teaching? You went to law school and now you're in private equity. Uh, it's, it's not a career I'm familiar with, right, as immigrant Korean parents. So yeah, it's, um, 
I didn't know. I, all I know is that it's, uh, I had sort of a childlike curiosity. I've always wanted to learn. I don't like getting hemmed into a box. Uh, I don't put other people in boxes, mm. and I don't like it when people put me in one. I just knew that when I graduated from law school at 28, with these two Harvard degrees and passed the New York bar, here's two things I knew. I needed to know more about money, and that money, in the end of the day, has a big voice at a table to decide things for people. Not everything. Too much today, by the way, but some things. And two, I also knew that I was over $130,000 in debt and that I was my parents couldn't afford to help me. I wasn't going to ask them to, even if they were, and that I, I had to pay back. I was stressed about money. So I think at 28, going into private equity, it was both personal stress about money and knowing that I had to be in a position that I could quarterback money. This is the question I started asking a lot of my guests more often. What is your relationship with money and how did you come to that conclusion that money in what you said, I'm just rephrasing here, yeah. is power? I've had a love-hate relationship with money, like I think a lot of people. It's not been an end goal for me. It's not been, you know, some people really obsess about having money. Remember, I taught high school for 12 grand a year, right? I have studied money for um, centuries of money. I studied economics. I studied how money moves things, the birth of capitalism, Adam Smith. Like, intellectually, I get the systems of money, right, in terms of social currency. For me, accumulating, hoarding financial wealth has not been a goal. Um, I also know I'm realistic. I know how I had to know how to use money as a tool. Like it's one of the things I think I'm pretty good at wielding in terms of uh, I'm good with money. I'm good with like visual arts, communicating the law. Um, I'm a very good writer. So I tend to be able to communicate in all these different forms of media. Money is a form of media. Fascinating. And of course, part of what catapulted you into seeing money as media is one of your key experiences. But let's talk a little bit about that shaping of your experience in private equity, yeah. right? So you decided, okay, this is the path you want to go down. Uh, and Meow Mix was the first deal for 30-something James. Yeah, 30-year-old uh, guy, pre-kids. Picture a high school teacher, a law school grad breaking into private equity. Uh, it wasn't easy. I joined a firm that no longer exists. At the time, though, it was one of the most prestigious firms in the United States. It was called J.W. Childs, mm -hmm. which was based in Boston. At the time that I joined, we were raising a fund. We had more money than I think Bain Capital had Wow! at that time. So it was one of the early big marquee firms. We had only eight of us managing close to three and a half billion dollars of money and um, very lean staff. Um, and so I just basically got thrown in. And so the first deal I did, I was 30 years old. It was right after 9-11. We bought the intangible assets to a cat food brand called Meow Mix. And so for, I think everyone knows Meow Mix. Meow, 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 that sort of annoying jingle. <laughs> yes. It was owned by Ralston. We have you to blame for that. Yeah. <laughs> Earworm. <laughs> yeah, it was owned by Ralston Purina. Nestle was buying Ralston. And the government said, you have to divest. And so we bought literally a brand. Um, it was a name, an ingredient list, two marketing Meow Mix mobiles that you drive up and down, and we cut a COPAC agreement. We paid $160 million for that. And so for four months, um, I think it's fair to say I spearheaded setting up a brand new company from scratch, hiring 44 employees. We had nothing. Literally, it was how do you take a list of ingredients, two Meow Mix mobiles, and a brand name and set up a functioning company in four months so that the government approves the transaction and says it's a viable competitor. And how do you do that? Most of all, guests are from the venture capital space, right? So that's slightly different. Yeah, it's, um, this is my theories on money, which is later on we'll get into why I started my own platform. That skill set of what I just described, it's a little bit of private equity. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of distressed. It's a little bit of venture, right? It's sort of taking existing IP pivoting it, operationalizing it, and then instead of raising money to create brand awareness, create the infrastructure, and buying customers, the purchase price of the asset is that. 
So it's basically pre-funding all of the rounds of venture. Yeah. And you buy IP and then you have to sort of pivot it and sort of communicate it in a different way. And so it wasn't easy. It was uh, very stressful for a 30-year-old former high school teacher, public defender. Um, I look back now, 22 years later, I was effectively a startup CEO. Mm -hmm. sitting in an office in St. Louis with 40 corporate Ralston, Purina, and Nestle people with me and my 24-year-old analyst. And that was my job. And I thought that was normal. Like private equity, as most of your listeners know, it's you don't do that. I didn't know better. I said, oh, this is what private equity is. I have to sort of be a pseudo CEO too. I think that sort of uh, kind of ignorance, benign, like childlike, why not? It served me well. I don't approach things feeling like I know all the answers, like I like, I just do them. Something magical happens when the third quarter ends and the fourth quarter begins, the energy changes. The fourth quarter is where games are won, where champions are made, and in business, it's where sales teams become legends. That's why HubSpot built Sales Hub to give sales reps the deal-making tools they need to win in Q4 and close the year strong. Sales Hub's prospecting workspace organizes your schedule, goals, and to-do list in one place to save your team precious fourth quarter time. Smart sequences help sales reps close deals faster than ever, and with an easy-to-use deal management tool, reps can find, track, and close deals all in one place. Plus, AI forecasting helps you accurately predict future success, which means less hoping for deal and more crushing targets. Put your sales team on the fast track to winning Q4 with Sales Hub. Learn more at hubspot.com slash sales. And so we talked a little bit about this. What makes a good operator? Why do, why do you think you were successful in that chapter? I mean, ultimately, there were two purchases that happened from that, right? At a billion yeah. dollar valuation, so ultimately a good outcome. Yeah. Especially in this market condition, which feels a little bit bleak. Yes. Where operationalizing is so important. How, how do you do this well? I think being a good operator, uh, it's all of those modes of communication I mentioned before, you have to be able to see the ethos of a company or brand. So we call it today, it's like, what's the purpose? What's the positioning? But every person or every company, there is a reason of existence, right? And it's being able to really figure that out and then communicating that organizationally, internally, externally to consumers and constituencies, having it be reflected in the numbers, Mm -hmm. in the software, in the legal documents. So if you think about my background, I've been all of those things. So it's one ethos and then sort of saying, ah, for this to be not hypocritical or systematically pure, it has to be reflected correctly in all five of those things. And so in my background, that's, I didn't know all this when I was 30 about what I was good at or what I was learning, but I think the other thing I would say to your listeners is that I think a great operator is good on the extremes. So like on the one extreme, vision, clarity, brand, inspire. And then the far end of the barbell, you better freaking know your numbers, right? You better freaking know the documents. It's the detail. And so I don't stress a lot about the middle. I'm like, if the barbell is correct here and it's here, Then I build a team and I say, do you see both ends of the barbell? Connect them. And that's your job. I'm not a, you know, helicopter CEO. I'm not a helicopter dad. I'm not a helicopter friend. I really believe in agency, uh, which is coming from high school. It's you give people agency and they have to make their decisions. Yeah. But But, but how do you set up an environment for success? And and this comes from... A lot of us, including myself, were put in positions of influence super early when probably we didn't deserve it. My dad was dying when I had to help out in the family business. I was 22 and I had stuff twice my age, more experienced than I was, which was the same case for you in many ways. And you were 30 commanding a presence and and creating these results. What kind of leader were you at that point in time? And did you make any mistakes? I make mistakes all the time. Um, I think some of the mistakes that I believe I've made fewer of and fewer it's on things like uh, being honest and having high integrity and being a decent person. Look, I'm not a shrinking violet. And yeah, there have been times in my personal and professional lives, I have regrets about losing my temper or saying things. I've gotten a lot better about that. I think what I have been pretty consistent about is later on when we talk about in my experience in my 40s, it's kindness, math. 
I try to treat people not as um, ends. They're just, they are people as humans. And I always think about like, how would I want my children to be treated if they work for this person? It's like a high school teacher, how a high school teacher would treat a person. Mm. I do that in almost any environment that I'm in, whether it's private equity or a tech investment, why should it change? So I motivate people to be their best and great teachers and coaches get the best out of people because the person wants to be successful, right? You can't push someone. It's more just saying, encouraging them and saying, I think you're better than this. I see this. Do you see it? So I, I think I'm very good at that. It's a natural high school teacher type thing. And on the other hand, I would like to quote win, but my spirit of winning is much more of a decathlete in the Olympics versus a 100 meter sprinter in track or a 100 meter swimmer. In the, in the decathlon, the spirit of winning is that you're not competing against other people. It's a point system. You're competing against yourself. And uh, there's thus a lot of camaraderie amongst the competitors. You're really encouraging other people to be their best. And I think the other thing to think about is that you can't be good at just one event. Mm. To win the decathlon, you have to be very good at 10 events and to be able to connect the commonality and, and training, to have the agility to sort of be wise about how do you apply the knowledge in one discipline to the 10th discipline in your training and your mental training and physical training. Let's think about to extend that, Sarah, like just range of life. I mean, you know that unfortunately I buried both my parents and, um, it needs to be said over and over again. I, I want all of your listeners to be successful in their quote work life and business life, but come on, like in the end of the day, if you lead a great professional life and your personal life is awful, I don't really believe that's the life that your listeners really want to lead. So the range and the expansiveness of your life to have agility in your life, I worry that people have become just monomaniacally obsessed about just their work. You also, part of the decathlon is to have a wonderful personal life and hobbies and be interesting. And you'd be surprised when you're an interesting human. Oftentimes that leads to incredible insights in your professional life too. Um, and given how little time any of us seem to have anymore, uh, that is one of the things that's happening. People are becoming less interesting. And when you're less interesting, you are less creative. Yeah. And you look at one thing a single way uh, with that lens of what you've only yes. done. So very interesting range that you've had. And one of the most interesting chapters, I think, of course, you've had many interesting chapters, but one that has taken light, interestingly, at this moment, was your experience with Ashley Stewart. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about how a Korean American became the CEO of a company that was catering to black plus size women. Yes, it makes all the sense in the world, Absolutely, doesn't it? Absolutely, 110%. And I think uh, we were laughing before this, that even though I'm sort of like old Uncle James, I've led much more of a millennial Gen Z type life in terms of having a lot of different like lives. It's been sort of a cat-like existence. So yeah, I was in my 40s, I ended up being a first-time CEO of one of the, a very important business for a certain segment of black women in the United States. It's actually one of the largest businesses that was serving and employing black women in the United States. And it came at a point in my life in my 40s where there are a couple of things happening. One, um, there were a lot of things about the what I was doing. I didn't love how I was doing it. Mm. And, I wanted Tell more, us more about that. Well, I wanted one more flexibility and mandate. So think about it. I'm distressed and venture, right? I am. And I think it's very similar skill set. Number two is that for a long time, this face with the dimples, uh, there were, this was one of the few faces, I would say, in the East Coast, highest buildings, upper echelons in private equity that kind of looked like this. It's changing now, but in my time, it was. This business served black women. I think it's fair to say that the capital markets and the general country was not particularly gracious toward this company for 20 something years. And but, remind us, of course, it, it's, a, it's an apparel company. Apparel, fashion business. 
I'm like the least fashionable person like ever. And uh, it had no Wi-Fi in 2013. That's the state it was in. It was already bankrupt three years before. So you had, it was so bad. So, you know, within three, four months, I had to hire an armed police officer to protect the employees leaving the parking lot because the vendors were starting to threaten employees because they had already lost money in a first bankruptcy. That's how bad the situation, company had never made money, never been cash flow positive. And um, you can imagine this was not a darling of my New York, Boston, LA, Wall Street connections. Think about the demographic, right? Warren Buffett says, invest in what you know, but there are not a lot of women slash black women managing oodles and oodles of money still. So it was also that. My father was dying. I thought a lot about uh, everything that they had wanted from me. It was not easy being them in this country as immigrants. And it's one of the things I admire about you. I have the most admiration for people who immigrate. There's no higher form of entrepreneurship in life. And uh, they wanted so desperately for their double Harvard son to leave a very stable and easy life. And I used to say to them, but you know, because you took so much risk, like, shouldn't I be taking more risk and helping other people more? Mm -hmm. And they would sort of say, no. And I said, because you did this, I can do this. And, and you know this, sometimes when you have success or pedigree, you become more risk averse. For me, I have more risk tolerance. That's mentally how I've been. I'm like, I have all this. Like, why would I live a a, a non-courageous life? What a boring life that would be. I look at these women and I immediately saw things that were not in spreadsheets or in like the investment banking decks and all the, you know, the boring pitch decks that we all see that say the same stupid thing over and over again, right? When I was in the stores, I saw my mother. I saw a little place that yes, it sold clothes, but it was a place where this particular woman could be herself and could be comfortable. That's what I saw. And I thought back about my mother who never felt comfortable in this country other than maybe once, twice a year, we would go to like a little Korean grocery store and I saw her whole body language change. I saw the same thing. And so at the time, my dad, again, my dad's dying. I'm 42, thinking about my life. Like, what's my legacy? Oh, James Reed, RIP, he's dead. He made a lot of money. That's not what I want for my my legacy and my children. I don't want that. And so I volunteered to do this for six months after the entire world turned its back on me, actually. I stayed for seven years, and we had a lot of success. Yeah, so... Initially, when this deal was done by Gordon Brothers, yes, the intention which I was a part of, yes. right? The intention was to break it up and sell it for parts, or what? No, the original intention was that uh, the professional management team, right? That's as a private equity guy, you have mm-hmm. professional CEOs yeah. that that they would do a good job. But what happened was that after Gordon Brothers did this, I was no longer there. I had my own investment platform. And the business wasn't doing well. And I was not part of the general partnership anymore, but I was still part of the board as a like outside consultant. And so the business was about to liquidate because it was a failed investment, right? It was the second bank, it was about to get, have a second bankruptcy. And I just, I felt accountable for a lot of reasons, right? As a former general partner, but also for the reasons I just articulated, more as a human, the employees, they didn't do anything wrong. Like the women working in the stores and the neighborhoods across the country, they didn't do anything wrong. Like they were working hard. They, these relationships were very important to them in the community. You know, women create a lot of positive externalities in communities and neighborhoods. This was an important safe place for a group of women that, They don't have a lot of safe places. And it just hit me very hard in my heart. Mm -hmm. And I felt accountable. I just said, this is, I can't just sit here and let this liquidate. So I volunteered for six months, hoping I could sort of stave off liquidation because I know everybody, right? I knew who was coming to liquidate the business. 
right? And that maybe I could find someone to buy the stores in six months, that a big retailer would take the stores and that I go home. But after six months, no one came. And I got very close to the women working the stores. I spent most of my time like in the stores, hanging jewelry. You have to picture me. Like, yeah. And, and remind us, this was how many, what was the scale of it? And I know it was in like Trenton, yeah. New Jersey. and Hundreds of millions of revenue, yeah. like 22 states. Think about every neighborhood in America that has a reasonably significant black population. Mm -hmm. It was there. Yeah. And picture me hanging jewelry and learning but. about like, Peplum mm -hmm. and Maryland's and me wearing pleated khakis, <laughs> you know, and sort of saying, hey, you know, yeah. can I help you? And, you know, I, I discovered fashion denim because there's no fashion denim in 2013 private equity. And so like the fashionistas at Ashley Stewart who worked with me, they're like, you know, James, you can pull off fashion denim. You don't have to wear pleated khakis. Yeah. So we just, it was a lovely it was hard. Like I went through a lot of, it didn't feel so good when a lot of my private equity and fancier friends kind of laughed at me. Mm -hmm. That didn't feel great. Um, it definitely brought up memories of some things during high school when I had to defend my mother against certain things. I mean, that's, that never goes away. Yeah. So, so let's, let's unpack that a little bit. So you have this business that's about to you know, go downhill. It was already on, yeah. you know, the middle of it the, was six, the downhill. Six weeks away from liquidation. Six weeks away. So yes. you were six weeks away from liquidation and you decided you didn't like the way these black women were being spoken about mm -hmm. because they think that you have this face. And so, you know, you're not one of the minorities in, in that way. It's different, yeah. right? Because, and, and even this weekend we were talking about this. Asian Americans are not considered people of color when we should be. That's right. Plus, you know, I have my two fancy degrees. Absolutely. So I'm in sort of a certain socioeconomic class. Mm -hmm. But I grew up with two immigrant parents who faced a lot of crap. Yeah. And that never goes away. And, and by crap, we mean racism. Yeah, of course. Directly. Yes. And so you're faced with this challenge where you decide, okay, let's give this one final chance and yes. you know the people you know the women who are running the stores and yet financially it's not working yes there were crazy insurance work workers comp claims that were crazy premiums there were all yes. sorts of incidents that were causing the business to not be profitable in the way it should be mm -hmm. sure it has revenues but the profitability was a big question mark how did you you know what was your strategy i mean let's talk about your first 90 days right the, yeah. the ceo strategy what did you do then First 90 days, and you have to think about, I laid out how intense it was, right? Yeah. So like the entire world's coming to kill this company, right? We know how the financial systems work, the structuring works, the advisors are coming, it's all coming. And um, I'm holding them off like this and saying, you know who I am. Right? This isn't some random CEO, like I'm a repeat player in the world's largest capital markets, you're not going to do it. So that's one conversation that's happening. The second conversation that's happening is to everyone else who works within the company and saying, this is true. I said, I am James. I know I may be the least qualified person to run this company, but I'm the only one who showed up and I get it. Look at my face. I understand. But maybe if you get to know me, you'll understand that when I say that I know more about this than you think. You remind me so much of my mom. Like I... That's all I said and said, you will be kind here. We will be mathematically correct. And if any of you, anybody is disparaging toward this woman, if you lie, cheat or steal and you hurt this company, I will personally prosecute you. Yeah. That's it. And so in terms of financially, I had to figure out, think about what we talked about with Meowmix. I'm very good at swallowing large amounts of chaotic data. So I just, lawyer James, quant James, you name it. <laughs> and then I said, I'm going to think this, and we'll start a company from scratch again. So just like Meow Mix, there's a brand called Ashley Stewart. The ethos, what was the ethos? To me, it was friendship. It was dignity. It was a safe place. Forget the clothes. That's the product right, was that, that feeling that it creates for people. 
And then um, I then had to do all the mathematical legal things and marketing and media to just make sure the company promoted and advanced that product. So the clothes had to be sexier, mm. right? The clothes had to be not like... Frumpy. Frumpy. It was sexy clothes for curvy women. I said, why are you so shy about the clothes you're picking are so basic? Like keyholes. Let's go. Let's be confident, right? And then on a technology side, I replatformed the entire e-commerce site in 60 days. We put up demandware and I had to put Wi-Fi in the corporate office. So all streams of work were happening at the same time and in one calligraphy stroke. And if anything did not advance the cause of this woman, it was cut. And that included people. And I told people that. I said, if you don't believe in what I'm doing, if you don't want to spend time in the stores and meet the women that you're serving, you can't work here. So just leave. I didn't fire her. I just said, then just leave. Go find another yeah. job. Like, but this is how desperate things are. And the women in the stores and I were, got particularly close. And I think one thing that a lot of people ask me is how did people react, predominantly black women in urban neighborhoods across the country, when you walked in, how did they react? And I'll tell you that I'll never be able to repay the debt that I have to them of a, how generous they were with me. They embraced me and they could have rejected me. Yeah. What, why is that, do you think? I think today I know why, because later on as we got, they're family now, they will always be family. And they used to say to me over time, they said, when you walked in, we could feel your heart. We knew that you were going to fight with us, for us, to the death. And they said, they asked me, they're like, it's ride or die. And I said, I'm not sure I understand that, what that <laughs> Please means. Please explain what you mean. <laughs> but I think that I understand. If you're asking me, is it to the death? Mm. I will fight with you to the death, but I'm not going to carry you. I'm going to, this is your fight. Sometimes you need a friend standing behind you. Yeah. That's how a good high school teacher is, right? It's if you want to win, I'm there for you. The Shine Online podcast hosted by Natasha Samuel is brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. Natasha interviews the brightest entrepreneurs she knows to bring you no-fluff advice, honest discussions about mental health, lifestyle aspects of entrepreneurship, as well as actionable strategies and success stories of those who've mastered the art of shining online in this conversational podcast. I love Natasha's recent episode on getting paid to create and was struck in particular by this phrase. Today, being on social media is synonymous with being a creator. So how will you make the most of your time on these platforms? Listen to The Shine Online wherever you get your podcasts. An example that particularly struck me as we've been unpacking this story together over the you know time we've spent together yeah. is the workers' comp insurance as yeah. something tangible that was an example. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this is, uh, I'll put on my dorky economic and mutualism hat on. So you know that it's increasingly insurance companies are not insuring anymore. They're all moving into wealth management. Mm -hmm. Our country is, unfortunately, there's a lot of division because the social compact, insurance companies insure and make money on mutualism. Like you spread risk. And so people don't like to do that anymore. It's much more of a hyper individualistic, I'm going to win at all costs. And so the system we put into Ashley Stewart was a mutualistic system. If you think about kindness and math, that is insurance. Let's prime better behavior pro-social behavior that creates positive externalities. Mm -hmm. We're going to punish negative externalities. Anti-star system, right? It's like the New England Patriots. Um, you want to be a star, don't work here. You can't. Um, and then once we prime behavior, which is what I teach at MIT, it's org theory and marketing, we're going to reward it financially. So all the compensation systems, the bonus systems, I rewrote all of them. If you, I measured positive externalities, which is why my TED talk is about goodwill. Yeah. And then on the workers' comp, that's a classic example. Like I, after I got the money to prevent this company from liquidating, and everyone used to know I'm the only one who showed up with money. 
at the bankruptcy court, other than the liquidators. Um, we almost couldn't pull the company out of the courts because we couldn't get workers' comp insurance. No one wanted to insure this company. And so I called in favors from my private equity life and said, you're going to do it because we've been working together for decades at this point, right? So I got the insurance, and I want you all to know that this system, we broke every actuarial table they've ever had. Yeah. To the, so so yeah. in essence, and if I may, because I know your story so well, yeah. um, but just for context here, basically these women in these apparel stores were claiming that they were being hurt on location. And they were getting hurt too because of bad operations. Like they were climbing ladders or doing work they shouldn't have been doing. And so part of this, it's a holistic change. It was a putting in LED light bulbs, right? Changing ops in terms of certainty of process so that there was less confusion about, there weren't bodies all over the place doing things. Mm. It was also me personally saying, if you come to work and you get hurt, my fault. Like, how can you go to work and get hurt? Like, I understand it. Like, if you go skiing or you go, like, snorkeling, yeah. you get hurt? Okay. How can you, in this day and age, come to work and get hurt? And I said, if I don't know about you getting hurt within, like, 24 hours and someone's hiding that knowledge from me, not good. And so they knew I cared too. I was like, I don't want you to be hurt. Like that's ridiculous. And so our workers comp claims and um, it all went down like 99%. Jeez. We won the highest award in Actual. the insurance yeah. industry. So the, so the Oscars of the insurance industry. We won. <laughs> because if you think about it from a venture future minded investor, put it, put it this way, part of the big thing about AI now AI only cuts data in zeros and ones in history. I've made most of my, quote, you know, success, whether that's financial or personal. I don't, I, I get the history. I'm not in the business of zeros and ones. I create twos, right? Like, you don't make money with just zeros and ones. You don't create societal change with just zeros and ones. You create new paradigms. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that we're, we've come to this point because... In essence, what we're talking about here, which is your big theme that has emerged, yes. is goodwill and that there's value to goodwill. So, of course, our listeners know what is goodwill. It is decided by the purchaser, that gap between the purchase price and the actual value, yes. right? That sometimes let's pick yes. it from the air and that's the gap. But what you're arguing here is that there is real tangible value to goodwill. Kindness creates goodwill. Like this is our relationship has been this is very classic, right? Like, I'm very interested in your success, Sarah. Thank like, you. I really, I, I know your story. I know what you're doing. I know that you have, like we all do, obstacles. And you have different obstacles, right? I want you to win. But I want you to do it in a way that's really satisfying to Sarah personally, too. Like, your path is going to be idiosyncratic. It and already is. It already is. <laughs> and so that's like, but the world is going to want to put you into a box. That's what we do. I'm going to be a friend that says to you, like, you're good. Try that. I got, you're good. That's, that, I think that is our relationship, right? And that's goodwill. Like that mm. intangible thing that you and I have that's that's an asset isn't it that's a that's a positive thing for society it's a positive thing for you it's a positive thing for me um that's good well that's the way commerce works i mean the best deals like the in the world are things done on handshakes you don't like i'm a lawyer so i can say this too but legally lawyers get in the way it's friction costs there's trust so I have tried to live my life in every aspect of my life. There's a lot of trust. I don't work with people I don't trust. Yeah. If I have to document it, we're not doing it. Yeah. So this vision of putting a tangible value to goodwill yes. came about from the story that your experiences with Ashley Stewart, where at the end, I can still remember as you were telling me the story as well, when you're... Uh, when my dad, dad passed away yeah. and yet 
you, and you expected no one to show up. I didn't want anyone to show up because I didn't And you didn't to... tell them yeah. either. I didn't tell them. No. The people, the employees in Ashley Stewart. And yet, tell us what happened. Yeah, my dad died. And, um, you know, big tough James, two years into this very difficult reinvention. It wasn't a turnaround. It's like a it's venture. It's a reinvention. And I had a week upon weeks. Dad dies. Daughter's in the hospital. And I was tired. I didn't tell anyone. I told my assistant to not tell anyone and just to lie and tell people I was on vacation. And I was commuting back and forth from Boston. Ashley Stewart was headquartered in Secaucus, New Jersey. And um, yeah, I didn't, I thought, I didn't want to be a burden. Even though I think I'm a pretty renaissance forward thinking leader in terms of servant leader, but still like, yeah, okay, I'm, I don't need help. I Tough don't need guy, help. James. James doesn't need help. <laughs> Tough James, right? Bruce yeah. Springsteen James. I got it. So I didn't ask for help. And um, in my personal life, I asked for a lot of help professionally, but not here. I was like, I got it. And I needed help. And so I didn't ask. And then what happened is that people all showed up at my dad's wake. And you have to picture the wake. It's a bunch of like sports coats, Korean primary care physicians. <laughs> okay. Like from yeah. Korea. Yeah. And then his college immigrant, high school immigrant friends, a few Jewish doctors from Long Island, mm -hmm. and that's it. And then in walked my whole office, um, home office, which looked like the United Colors of Benetton. Love it. Right? Yeah. It just naturally, it w was that way. We had like 15 languages. Our potluck parties were ridiculous, right? The food was ridiculous. But when I really started, got very emotional, just like heaving, crying, actually, um, was when the women, um, all black women from the frontline retail locations, they came and they carpooled to come. They hugged my Korean mother and said, oh, Mrs. Ree, you know, your son talks about you a lot. And we just want you to know, we think you did a good job with your son. And then they came to me and said, there's a woman named Cherry. She held my hand and she said, Mr. James, you didn't think we'd come here for you? And I cried. And it was that moment I, this happened, I was, you know, 44. I, it was freedom. Mm. Full freedom. I'm like emotional freedom. I'm like, this is what's important. Look at this, look at this scene. Yeah. I have my Korean mother with my black female colleagues and my whole life is sitting here. Every country and... And I'm crying in front of them, and I'm like, good, I should be. How wonderful this is. And it reminded me later on of the scene which we all watch. I don't know if you've seen this yet. This is like an American staple. It's a Wonderful Life. It's a classic Christmas movie where George Bailey, he's a banker, and he's losing against, like, a big bank, and he is a small town. And at the end, uh, his whole neighborhood comes to pitch in to give him money to help him save this community bank against a big bank. Yeah. And he looks at everyone and that example, that is the monetization of goodwill. Mm. What you saw in that movie and at my dad's funeral, that's what goodwill looks like. It's just so hard for us to freaking see it, right? Because all we, we get pounded with things we see all the time. Sometimes the most important things oftentimes are the things you can't quantify, mm. right? You just feel it. Yeah. And I think that's what I'm oddly good at is getting people to, I make intangible, awesome things tangible. And so the red helicopter yes. was that tangible yes. thing. And it dates back to your childhood. Yes. And this is what, what I'm working on now is a, call it a brand world ecosystem, media ed company, community, I don't know what to call it. It's called Red Helicopter. And it's a that's a very tangible thing people can picture. And I opened up my TED talk about this, but here's a longer version was I got a red helicopter as a gift when I was five. And my immigrant parents were unsure about why I got it. I was five, so I was unsure. There was a little bit of confusion and a little bit of tension, actually. Like, how can you not know why this family gave you a 
And so they found out the reason why this family gave it to me was that I had been, and I remember this, I'd been sharing my lunch that my mom would pack every day with my friend. Because he would often not have lunch. And I didn't know this, but his mother had died that summer before kindergarten. And so I'm sure being a dad now, that that dad was beside himself, right? He had four kids under the age of 10. He didn't have time. I'm sure money was tight. So I gave him half my lunch. And the family all came in and they wanted to meet me. And they didn't even tell me. They just, I remember him, he kind of like patted my head, stroked my head. And my parents got very emotional. They just said, you know, don't forget this. Like, because things were not easy in the rehousehold at that time either. And so the irony is that I had such feelings of abundance, even though we had very little. And then I realized as I got older, as my parents wanted me to be success, successful, the more I got, like in terms of pedigree, connections, money, wealth, I was feeling like increasingly I had a scarcity mindset. Hmm. I want more. I want to win. Like, I want to beat them. And so Ashley Stewart was my gift to my parents, to a lot of things. I was able to reconcile red helicopter abundance with my private equity and legal career. And I just want everyone to know, I rarely say this, but the re financial results were absurd. We were right, the world was wrong. And uh, we showed the world there was value here. And IRRs were absurd. Triple digits, everyone made a ton of money. And my investors made a ton of money. And they deserved it because they had trust, they had faith. And I'm more proud of the way we did it than what the result was. And the way we did it has led to a lot of things, as you know, like it's leading to what is Red Helicopter. Six months after I left Ashley Stewart, after it turned into seven years, you know, like I chair entrepreneurship at arguably the most prestigious historically black university in the country. You got a Korean dude yeah. chairing entrepreneurship at Howard University. And when they offered me that role, yeah, I cried. I mean, I had no other, I just couldn't believe it. And so I've had so many of these type of things happen. Urban League giving me the Frederick Douglass Award. I mean, I, I can't even put into words what that feels like, right? And the consistent thing that they say is that we saw how you did it. Mm. I wanted these women to win so badly on their terms. And that's what I'm most proud of, is that sometimes I had to translate for them, but I never took their voice away. It was their voice. Just like in our relationship, hopefully over the next many years, like you're gonna live a lot longer than me, like my, I'm old, is um, I want you to be successful on your terms, because that's freedom. Money is not freedom, right? Money yeah. is a small part of freedom, yeah. that's freedom. So there's a few ways I want to take this. And one is in particular, why those that are more privileged come from the scarcity, scarcity mindset and the way in which that has influenced the work you now do with families, right? Yes. Uh, Fire Pine Group, that was also a little bit a while ago. Yeah. But you had already this impact lens long before impact investing was a thing, arguably. Right? Yes. How, how does this come into play in... What needs to shift in the mind of investors who always, and, and I think you're absolutely right, people feel like they don't have enough. I work with some of the richest families and they're unhappy. So absolutely unhappy. Absolutely yeah, unhappy. Yeah. Why? Because it's a, this is like a 10 hour conversation. I'm going to do it very <laughs> yes. quickly. Number one, part of this is historical. The world is flooded with so much financial currency, not off the gold standard. It's all, it, we're printing money right now that money is so cheap that people have sort of gravitated toward money and forgotten that there's a whole other form of currency called social currency, right? Like neighborhoods and democracy. <laughs> and we have gotten confused that the economy is, you want a good economy because you want a really stable and positive country. I don't think it's the other way around. Right? I think the economy serves a country, 
I'm pretty sure that that's sort of how things should work. Number three, families. Yes, I've been managing family money for a long time. And I stumbled onto that conclusion as well. Why? Because families care about their legacy, their reputations, right? They don't, you don't just make money any way. And there are certain families, they've been, they've been rightfully embarrassed. They have had their names removed from museums. It's not okay to make money like selling opioid to vulnerable people. I don't want to make my money that way. I don't want to stick my children with that legacy that their dad did that. Families get it. I think that what's happened is that we've become so anonymous that sometimes when you are anonymous, like on social media, but even liquid capital markets, when your name is not stuck to something that you can sort of say, oh, I didn't know. And that's why I think one of the things, as much as there's some um, things about crypto that concerns me, what I do like about blockchain, I do like the fact that there's real accountability for your transactions. And so I've really tried to hold people and myself like, you're accountable for how you deploy your capital, time, um, personal capital or money. That's why. And I, yeah, people are, I have a lot of friends who have so much money. They're not happy. And they call me and tell me they're not happy in tears, not happy. And they say to me, they're like, you're so free. They have much more money than I do. Right. They have much more like, like a, title or a whatever. Yeah, I am free. I'm free because I'm very confident in my relationships with people. And I'm free because I know who I am, which means what I'm good at, what I'm bad at. As is without coach shifting. Yeah. And I think that's what's enabling me to think about it. I'm in a lot of different worlds at MIT and Howard. We were with Mayor Wu and, you know, Howard and PBS are filming my class next year. And I'm on Brene Brown, which is skewed more toward, I think, white women. I think that's fair. And then Simon Sinek. And these are more dudes, right, that yeah. are, it's the same person. Yeah. So let me ask you this question. Ashley Stewart was a couple of years ago. Yeah. And yet the calls that you were getting from JP and Diamond to be on the JP Morgan board and things yeah. like that for the Black Pathways and all these things. The calls came only recently. And, of course, we're going through a moment in America yeah. Why do you think, why now? Why is all of this happening years later? And okay. where are we in America? I'm going to answer that. And <laughs> the first part will sound slightly immodest, but I have to say it. I'm going to put my investor hat on. I've lived the world that people are living through now. I bet on it 10 to 12 years ago. I was right. Think about 2010, 11, 12, 13. I was saying things like, I'm worried about social dissolution tension. I'm betting on and investing in women. There's not enough capital there. Why wouldn't I want to put money then there? There's more arbitrage. Like you, you, Not just fairness and justice, but also like as an investor, why wouldn't I want to invest here then? I was betting on a lot of these things happening in terms of uh, consciousness of different races. I was betting on systems becoming weaker, whether it's higher ed or whether it's... Um, traditional banking systems. Mm -hmm. I've studied this. This is what I studied at Harvard. It was 19th century, just change. That's what I'm good at is change, isn't it? And so what's happening now is that we went about our business, Ashley Stewart, very quietly. Like, it, you know me. I'm not saying, hey, look at everything I'm doing. We did it. And the reasons we did it were sincere. And I didn't need external validation for what we did. I had it internally. I had it at my dad's wake. But what's happened now in 2020, after George Floyd, after the Asian community started getting their own, a lot of these things start happening, right? And then you have contested elections. You've got, uh, Ray Daly wrote a book about Chinese American, like you have geopolitical tension now. All these things are happening. That's why. So now people's consciousness they're receptive to systemic uncertainty, right? Things don't last forever. This country 
in the U.S., there was a civil war 160 years ago, and there was a Great Depression 100 years ago, and we had World War II in 1940s and the Vietnam. It, it, this is a very recent thing, right? It's three generations. And people forget. They forget because we're bombarded with social media. It's short-termerism. We don't read anymore. Yeah. People do not read philosophy, history, literature. They don't understand. People don't spend enough time understanding biology, mm. right? Some of our best neuroscientists, instead of improving the condition of people, they advise large tech funds to manipulate people's behavior. Think about, think about this. So that's what's happening. So after the last few years, people said, that's what you did. That's what you did. And that's why you were saying this. And I said, yeah, do you really think what we did and why I did it was to sell clothes? And so Ted, Brene, Simon, Howard, MIT, Ashoka, right? And then a large, some of the largest companies, I'm not going to name them, but in the world approach me to work on change. Mm -hmm. So it's internal mindset change, external messaging change, um, just org theory change. And all of that, when you have that sort of mindset, you're incredibly agile, right? It's, you create teams and brands that can withstand shock. And so there's lots of shock coming. And that's what I was going to, James. We're, we're facing a lot of shock in the markets, I mean, cost of capital, you're talking about how money was cheap. It is no longer cheap with yeah. interest rates. I was with Janet Yellen last week in New York, yeah. and, you know, we're going to look forward to another hike. Things are going to be increasingly challenging. We are also challenged by the anti-woke movement, yeah. where despite all the need, the clear need for it, the underinvestment in communities of color, we're under attack right now. Yeah. Are you concerned? Have we lived this before in this way? What's going to happen? Oh, I, I think we all have lived this. And I think one of the things that why, <laughs> why things are becoming more public facing for me recently, as much to my chagrin at times, you know this, in my 40s, I was very happy sort of being in obscurity. It was really great. Um, I think that I'm not a big acronym user. I don't use acronyms. I don't buy into fads of the times. Like my strategy is very boring. My life strategy is boring. Kindness, math. Like it's methodical. And uh, kindness is one of these things you never have to hedge. It's never wrong to be kind. There are very few things in life like that, right? Is there ever a scenario where it's okay to be unkind? And unkind is, kind is not nice. It's a high school teacher, right? You disappointed me, right? You're not your best you. There's never a situation where that's not a good thing. And so the woke thing, I, I don't think what I'm saying is particularly woke. It's much more humanist. Mm -hmm. It's about much more 18th, 19th century Newtonian, Adam Smith, Rousseau. It's about humanism. It's about the dignity of a, of a life. That's what I'm espousing. Yeah, but not, not everyone in America today, of course, agrees. And what do you say yeah. to you know, people who think, oh, kindness is a waste of time? I mean, I don't know what James is on about. I think that in private, they don't think that. I have conversations with many, many different types of people. I am in every state, every race, every age. And the conversations I have are remarkably similar. People want similar things. They're concerned about family. They are. They're, they're concerned about this country. We just don't communicate it particularly well. And I think one of the reasons I'm spending a lot of time in the media like side of things right now is that for some reason in this window of time, just given some of my experience set, and I feel like I can say some things that people can all agree to. And maybe it's because it's also coming out of the mouth of a financier, like some of these quote, soft things. Yeah. I am also talking about cold, hard cash and economics and putting it into financial terms. 
and reminding people that there are certain things that you can measure in a different way that's not per gap. <laughs> yeah. That there are measurements that are that that do exist. And I'm, I think it helps that I'm also of this age, mm. right? I'm sort of Gen X, but with a sort of Gen Z spirit. I'm not white. I'm not black, right? I'm sort of this face. And, you know, and I think what's happening now, Sarah, is like the fun part of this, as you know, I'm doing a lot of creative things. I really like, and this is, I'm, I'm a creative person. I'm a creative. Both. Finance people can be creative. Yeah, I think yes. some of the best finance people are creative. Steve Jobs was a creative. Mm -hmm. Albert Einstein was a creative. They saw things that people didn't see and they made it visible to other people so they could share it. Yeah. And that is what I'm trying to Which do with Helicopter. What I wanted to prompt. Mm. Coming April 9th, 2024, we are looking forward to your book with Bated Breath. What are we looking forward to in this chapter? <laughs> the, the movie, when is that coming up? So Red Helicopter, this sort of quote community, it's a, it's a way of being. So the first step was to be able to make sure I could teach it, which is why I've been at Howard, MIT, Duke, and a lot of these schools. The next step is that they're filming it and they're gonna air it on PBS. Mm -hmm. the, next, yeah, the next step is this book that if I couldn't teach it, I wasn't willing to write a book. Right. Mm -hmm. So now that I could teach it because I saw my students and then I, you know, I trained McKinsey and I train a lot of other sort of leaders. I'm like, ah, this is the way I can communicate all of these disciplines in a complex way, very simply. And you all understand it. So that's what's in the book. Um, it is meant to be a timeless book, picture a book that's like if Ray Dalio crying at H Mart, <laughs> Jay Shetty. <laughs> You know, think like a monk yes. and like Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. If you put all those four books into one book, it's meant to be just like my TED talk is something that an adult will read, a leader of titan of industry, and then they want to share it with their senior in high school. It. It's the things that we are not taught in school. Mm -hmm. And it's also a gentle reminder about how ephemeral life is and about like to love your parents, right? It's, it's a book about encouraging families and about children, about legacy. But it's also a book about this is how you reinvent, turn around and make a lot of money in a business. It's all of it in one. Yeah. So I, I am pretty sure that the book, there's a lot of interest already. I've been composing music for a rock opera. Mm. Um, they're just that. Um, it's communicating this feeling and this mind in a multi-sensory way. And, you know, I always thought that when I was running Ashley Stewart that um, it just felt like a live musical. Yeah. And the world was watching and then they participated and I produced concerts and it sort of bended space time. Like it's not work or life. It's just why shouldn't we live a very successful life? Yeah. Right? That's sort of what I'm... I think a lot of Asian uh, Buddhist scholars, they always call me and they're like, it sounds, I said, yeah, sure. But it's, you know, I was raised Catholic. So it's, <laughs> it's Catholic and Buddhist. I don't know. Like yeah. it's sort well, of. Well, everyone very, has a different take to that. And yeah. that's the beauty of the red helicopter. Yeah. It's like, and yeah. I'm, if you notice there's on the cover, there's no picture of a red helicopter because I'm asking everyone. I'm like, it's not prescriptive. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. It's your red helicopter. And so, James, what a meaningful conversation. We could go on for hours, and we will do that in the years of our yes. life together, hopefully. What was something that I should have asked you that we didn't cover before we go to the rapid fire? Oh, my goodness. I think maybe who is the most important leader, maybe, that I've mm. tried to emulate? or Yeah. And I think you know what my answer is going to be is it's my mother. Um, I am my mother's son, and I, a lot of the work I'm doing, I promised her, too, in my eulogy to her. Um, she was a great leader, and she was firm, resolute. She allowed me to fail. She kicked my you-know-what when I, when I was not good to other people. When I had success at the expense of other people, my mother was very, very tough on me. 
Um, and she was generous, but she was also like relentless, mm. right? But my mother lived through what she did. My mom was so thoughtful that toward the end of her life, uh, she went back and renewed her nursing license to take care of the veterans of the Korean War that saved her country when she was a little girl. That's how thoughtful my mother was. Like she said, I have a debt to repay mm -hmm. and I'm going to take care of these men yeah. now. Yeah. And so I, I always want to talk about my mother and like a lot of the women of Ashley Stewart they shared a lot of these qualities too. They're quiet leaders. They never get credit. Yeah. Partly they never ask for it. And so my whole job at Ashley Stewart, I gave them credit. I told the entire world about them. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Well, James, we've now arrived at the rapid fire. Fill in okay, all the I'm questions. Ready. Yes. First thing that comes to mind is what I always say is probably the right thing. Fill this blank. Success to me is Legacy of being known, of being generous. Failure to me is? Dying alone. Mm, book that changed your mind. The book I just wrote called Red Helicopter. What's your most used app on your phone right now? Waze, because I'm terrible with directions. <laughs> what? Disappointing the terrible. Asian American community. Terrible. <laughs> Money or power? Influence. Mm, what keeps you up at night still? I want my children to not die alone. What are you afraid of? My children, like living in a country that is just not in a good direction. Mm. Yeah. What still is your biggest insecurity? Like I think I like a lot of people, like it's nice to have friends and be, be liked. I think sometimes I still have that. Mm. What's an opinion you have that most people don't agree with? That the basis of our financial systems using GDP as a marker for success is even though the founder of the GDP metric said it was not to be used as a mark of success is just wrong. And that uh, economists get a lot of things wrong because they believe that the premise is that people are rational economic actors, which we're not. So the entire, like, the foundation of it is false. Yeah. Worst advice you've been given? Oh, when I was uh, applying to go into finance from law school and an HR recruiter told me that because I went to law school that uh, I had no shot and that I should have be a, live the life of a lawyer. And the best advice that you've been given that you wish everybody listening would also heed? My father-in-law, who's a very successful person, reminding me every day while I was breaking into finance used to say to me, do not forget your values, James, because people will, want, people will want to take it away. And he told it to me. It used to annoy me that he kept saying this to me. Um, but in retrospect now, um, he was right. Don't, don't forget your values because you got to look at yourself in the mirror and have your kids look at you. And other people have children too. To stay grounded in your values. And finally, where can we all find you? Go to redhelicopter.com. I'm not a big social media guy. Um, you will become. I'm getting pressure to be a little bit more. But like, you know, pre please pre-order the book. Buy the book. And I'll come and talk to you about it. And talk to your companies and your region groups about it. It's not, again, it's not meant to be prescriptive. I hope you will cry, laugh, and learn, I think, when you read the book. Oh, cry, laugh, and learn. Well, that's how I feel throughout this entire conversation. Oh. James, thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself. Thanks, Sarah. And your leadership. Thank you. And thanks so much for tuning in this week. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow our socials on Sarah Chang Global to get the latest on the show. It would really help me out too if you enjoyed this to rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts and share your favorite episodes with a friend. I'm Sarah Chang Spellings, and you've been listening to Villain Dollar Moves.